The untold story of war production. All wars are about competition in production. The side that can produce more is always going to triumph over the other side. This is a war between the factories. The real story of how the world wars were fought and won. It may sound strange, but modern wars, they're not won by battles. They're won by factories. They swamped the other side with a tide of mass production. And those factories would shape the modern world. Volkswagen, Fiat, Mitsubishi, they're all household names now, but they made those names as war factories. Gotta get back to work. Almost 2,000 kilometers south of Moscow, on a beak-shaped peninsula protruding into the Caspian Sea, lies an industrial complex known as the Black City of Baku. The Black City was the sort of epicenter of the earliest phase of industrialized oil production in Baku. Black because of the enormous amounts of pollution, both in the air and in the land and in the water. On one level, the Black City is just a giant refinery, but more accurately, we should call it a whole cluster of factories that are involved in the entire process of converting that sort of filthy black oil that comes out the ground into something really sophisticated like kerosene. At the start of the 20th century, Baku was a throbbing hub of activity. I think the easiest way for us to understand what Baku is like is to think about, say, for example, how San Francisco was during the gold rush. For more than a century, it was the beating heart of Russia's oil industry. It was undoubtedly the leader in its field. So you've got the world's first oil tanker, the world's first deep well, the world's first international pipeline. All of them come out of Baku. At the top of its game, Baku was producing more than half of the world's oil supply. Winston Churchill says, if oil is queen, then Baku is her throne. That's how important it is. And as the world went to war, the oil factories of Baku became one of the most important places on the planet. The Second World War was fought over oil. The resource that made it possible for the armies that confronted one another on the battlefield was that one and that one first and foremost. It ultimately compels Nazi Germany to invade the Soviet Union, which in a way turns out to be Nazi Germany's great undoing. One key target of the Nazi invasion is the oil factories of Baku. Baku lies in the Eastern Caucasus, and the Caucasus are vital for Hitler because they contain tons and tons of oil, and Hitler needs to get his hands on that oil in order to win the war. But the story of Baku's oil-producing war factories does not begin and end with the Nazi invasion of Russia. It begins with an arms dealer, whose surname now stands for peace. In 1873, this unassuming guy in his mid-40s steps off of a ferry in Baku with 25,000 rubles stuffed in his pocket um, and a plan to change the world. His name is Robert Nobel. Robert Nobel was the oldest of three brothers whose father had made and lost a fortune inventing weapons for the Tsar of Russia. When he died, his business was split between the three of them. Now, the most famous of the Nobel brothers remains Alfred Nobel, who had made an absolute fortune out of patenting dynamite. And, of course, he bequeathed so much of his legacy to, to found the Nobel Prizes for literature and art and economics and, of course, peace. The middle brother, Ludwig, took over their father's arms business in Russia. And he gave a job to his oldest brother, Robert. In 
Robert is the problem child of the family. He's absolutely rubbish with money. And he comes to be in Baku because his brother Ludwig gives him the 25,000 rubles and says, go down there um, and you're now in charge of buying some wood for rifle stocks that we're supplying for the Russian army. On the way down to Baku, Robert Nobel came across a captain. And this captain told him this wonderful story about how Baku was so rich in oil that everybody could make their fortune. He's spinning him tales of swaggering oil men who become instant millionaires, and Robert, being Robert, eats it up. So when he arrives in Baku, Robert Nobel is not wanting to buy walnut for gun stocks. What he's wanting to buy is an oil well. And the oil well that's been recommended to him by the captain is owned by guess who? The very captain who was told in the story. I'd be amazed if Ludwig didn't batter him, to be honest. 25,000 rubles sounds like a lot. I'm assuming it was a lot. I'm assuming they weren't going to make half a dozen rifles for the Russian Imperial Army. Now, you might think that Ludwig will just be so angry with Robert, he almost would never want to speak to him again. But actually, Ludwig knows his brother well. Ludwig knows that Robert is a real engineering genius. He's a real guru. And instead of sending him off with a flea in his ear, he actually sends him back to Baku and says, right, well, let's get on with it. Let's get this oil out of the ground and let's turn it into something useful. Let's turn it into kerosene. By 1876, the Nobel brothers had 300 barrels of finest kerosene used to fuel oil lamps in St. Petersburg. It was so successful that Tsar Alexander issued a special decree granting them a license to supply kerosene to the Russian capital. And so the Nobel Brothers Petroleum Company, known in Russia as Branabel, was born. But once he had to supply oil in volume, Ludwig Nobel was faced with a whole host of problems. We should remember that the Nobels, they're not interested in oil. They're interested in the money that can be made from oil. The conundrum is the different parts of the factory. There's the oil production part, there's the refining part, and then there's the marketing part. The place in which oil was going to be consumed was crucially in the cities, particularly in Moscow and St. Petersburg. And the key thing that the Nobels need to do is to get the raw material of refined crude from the oil-producing area in Baku to the place in which it was going to be burnt in, in the cities. The Russian transport system sucks. The, the process for getting this kerosene from Baku to St. Petersburg includes ramshackle teamsters loading it onto horse-drawn wagons, whose job it is to move the oil from the wells to the refinery so that it can be produced. These teamsters are the weakest link in the 3,000-kilometre-long factory chain, which begins with the journey from oil well to refinery. The old-fashioned way of getting oil from where it was extracted to where it was processed was very simple. You put it into barrels, then you put them on transport, and the transport would then take them to where it was going to be processed. Problem with that was spillage. You were also always risking the Teamsters going on holiday or going on strike. It was hopelessly inefficient. So what Ludwig Nobel does is he comes up with a much better idea. He replaces all that cumbersome transport with a three mile long oil pipeline, which went directly from where the oil was extracted straight through to where it was going to be processed. And all he had to do was turn on the tap And when he doesn't want it anymore, what he can do is simply turn it off. The whole thing takes a year to lay and it costs him $50,000. It's a lot of money back then, but he knows he's gonna get his money back and he really does because in just 12 months after he fires all the drivers, he's recouped his money. Yet while he could be ruthless when he had to be, Ludwig Nobel also understood the advantage of treating his workforce properly. Most oil barons in Baku, they just treat their workforces appallingly. They, they just almost regard them as slaves. They pay them like 50 cents a day. They don't care how they're housed. They don't care how they're fed. You know, just get on with it. Now, Ludwig is much more farsighted. 
What Ludwig does is build his workforce a whole village to live in, gives all of the children free schooling, gives a profit share scheme where 48% of all the profits get shared among the workers. There's greenery shipped in to make them have better living conditions. So he's ruthless when he needed to be, but actually he treated his workforce a hell of a lot better than anyone else did. This ideal community was called the Villa Petrolia, and it was way before its time. Once his workforce was settled, the next hurdle for Ludwig was a much bigger transport problem. This is Baku in southern Russia, on the edge of the Caspian Sea. And the way you get oil from here all the way through to St. Petersburg is you ferry it across the Caspian Sea, then along the route of the River Volga over Lake Ladoga to St. Petersburg. That's 3,000 complex, difficult kilometers. However, it's actually cheaper to come here to the US go to Philadelphia and bring oil by ship across the Atlantic Ocean, round into the North Sea, through into the Baltic, and eventually reaching St. Petersburg. That is 13,000 kilometers, but it's still easier, still cheaper than 3,000 kilometers in Russia. So Ludwig set about designing the Zoroaster, the world's first oil tanker. Ludwig's revolutionary design piped 242 tonnes of oil into two big tanks at the front and rear of the ship, connected by a pipeline running between them. To add buoyancy, he divided the rest of the ship into 21 watertight compartments, which he called cisterns, and placed the engine in the centre of the ship to give it stability. There had never been an oil tanker in the history of humanity before this moment. And why they're bringing those things in is not because Nobel is particularly interested in innovation per se, but it is a means of controlling the system and therefore generating money from it. By the start of the 20th century, ships like the Zoroaster were transporting 76 million barrels of oil a year from Baku to the world beyond. More than half of the world's oil comes from Baku. Now, it depends on what type and grade of oil you're talking about, but depending on what you're looking at, Baranabel, the Nobel Brothers business, is supplying some 9 to 40% of that oil coming out of Baku. So that means they're supplying up to 45 to 20% of the world's oil supply. It would not last. Clouds were gathering on the horizon. Clouds of war and revolution. Between them, they would conspire to bring the Nobel Enterprise crashing down. World War I was the world's first great oil war. But when war broke out in July 1914, none of the combatants fully understood the importance that oil would play in the conflict. At the outbreak of the First World War, nobody's really thinking seriously about oil in any kind of strategic way, because after all, you know, mechanisation, as we know it, simply hasn't happened. There is no such thing as the tank. Uh, the whole idea of an air force simply you know, isn't really in the minds of generals. This is a war that might be fought with men and horses. They don't require oil, they require food. Whether you're the French trying to get into Germany or whether you're the Germans trying to come round through Belgium and take Paris, everything is based on shifting millions of men. So it's not oil that's important at the beginning of the First World War. It's coal, it's steam trains, it's rail transport. That would soon change. The thing about war is that it rapidly advances technology. And in the First World War, you get the invention of the tank, you get the German submarine warfare, you get aeroplanes. Those planes were often acting as artillery spotters, and artillery would play an unexpected role in the rise of oil. Artillery becomes completely and utterly pivotal in every battle in the First World War. What's often forgotten is that TNT, the substance which goes into most artillery shells, is actually partly derived from oil. 
And so therefore you've got almost every major offensive in the war beginning with an artillery barrage of more than a million shells. And all those shells need oil. And you've got throughout the entire war almost a billion artillery shells being used. Oil became more and more important for the war effort on both sides. And by the end of the war, people understood that the oil had completely transformed the nature of that warfare. It is said the Allies were swept to victory on a tide of oil. This was a huge problem for the Germans because Germany did not have access to any major source of oil. Now, there's one obvious target, and it's General Ludendorff who comes up with this plan to push south away from the Ukraine to try to seize the oil fields at Baku. That's by far the largest oil producer in the old world at that time. But that's separated from the German front line by almost a 1,000 miles of territory. Before he can even put it into operation, two big things get in his way. First, the British. The British beat him to it. Because what they do is push up from the oil fields of Mesopotamia and they take control of Baku. And then there's this other small thing, the Russian Revolution. Until the Russian Revolution, the Nobel brothers had done very well out of the war. By the time the war started, Ludwig Nobel had actually died, and the control of the company, Branabel, passes to his son, Emmanuel. By 1916, he's controlling half of the Russian oil industry. Branabel is now producing about a third of Russia's crude oil, 40% of the refined oil, and she's supplying two-thirds of domestic consumption. Uh, and what they've also built is the country's first explosives factory. So you've got oil and explosives. I mean, that's a heady mixture. But behind the scenes, things weren't looking so shiny in Baku's land of liquid gold. If you were looking for somewhere in Russia prior to the First World War to breed sedition, you would love Baku because it's full of disaffected workmen who are treated appallingly. So, of course, it becomes an absolute fermenting pot for revolutionary activity. Essentially, it becomes like a training ground for wannabe revolutionaries, um, including one guy from sort of just around the corner in Georgia. His name, Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin sees the oil industry in Baku as a, a crucible for the potential of revolution. In that space, we see so many of the revolutionaries who went on to be leading lights in the Bolshevik Revolution and the period afterwards, cutting their teeth. Despite the bubbling tensions, Emmanuel Nobel refused to sell up and get out. History's gonna prove him spectacularly wrong. Because in February 1917, the Tsar abdicates, and then that December, you've got 2,000 oil workers demanding that Branabel's fields be nationalised. And in June 1918, you have the new Soviet regime giving them exactly what they wanted. Those oil fields are taken away from Branabel and they're given to the workers. Emmanuel has lost everything apart from his life. The reason that Emmanuel gets out with his life is because of the foresight of his father and his own as well in how well they treated their workforce. Most oil barons are absolutely loathed by their workforces. But actually, with, with Emmanuel Nobel, it, it's different. Because the family has uh, instigated this Villa Petrolia and, and a comparatively benign regime with their workforce. The story goes that the Bolsheviks came to arrest him and presumably do away with him as a capitalist swine, but that his workforce prevented them from doing so. His workers stand literally in front of them and say, you're not taking him away, he's been good to us. And actually, Emmanuel Nobel goes free and he's spirited up to St Petersburg. And one story has it that he's actually smuggled uh, over the border dressed as a woman. Branabel, like the rest of Baku, was now a Soviet worker's paradise. 
But all was not well in the Garden of Lenin. The thing about Soviet Russia is that capitalists like the Nobels are bad and you don't want them. And so what they do is to introduce something called war communism, which means an attempt to essentially run a complex industrial economy without money, without prices, uh, and without wages. Now, when you apply this to almost any modern industry, the result is quite simply catastrophic. You take away everybody's incentive to push harder and achieve more and better the production and better the methods and, and innovate. Um, because you don't get anything else for it, so why bother? In many ways, the more long-term structural problem for the Soviet economy is the lack of prices, which means that there is absolutely no way to decide how to allocate resources. And you can see this very clearly in the oil industry, which is taken over by the state and run with no reference to prices, no money wages being paid to the staff, and, crucially, with pretty much all of the technical experts and managers who were typically not Russian leaving the country. Oil output plummets to just 13% of what it was before the First World War. All of that money coming in to Russia as a result of the oil going out disappears, and this industrial paralysis is basically nationwide and industry-wide industrial production simply collapses. Russia was one of the most rapidly growing industrial economies in the 10 years leading up to 1914. But by 1922, industrial output in Russia is about 10% of what it had been before the war. Lenin needs to rescue his oil industry, and fast. Lenin was painfully aware that Soviet Russia needed Baku's petrodollars to keep the Soviet Union solvent. But the oil was drying up, and the West was boycotting what little he could produce. So he and his successor, Stalin, had to do whatever it took to get the oil flowing again. Lenin's got no choice. He can either just keep going, and eventually the whole oil industry is going to go bankrupt, or he's going to do the unthinkable. And that's to bring in Western oil companies like Shell, the hated capitalist companies, men with top hats and cigars and big moustaches. The very people he fought the revolution against are now coming into Russia to help the Soviets run their oil business. What you have is companies like Shell, Vickers, even Standard Oil, going in and finding all these inventive ways around the boycott to revamp and re-innovate Russia's oil industries. So there's a mutually beneficial deal to be done, if you will. The Soviets are actually relying on the capitalists to kickstart the whole thing again. Production rose to nearly 100 million barrels, the third highest in the world. Such bounty naturally attracted the attention of those who were not so rich in oil. One of them was the new chancellor of Germany, Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler was obsessed with oil, and for good reason. Oil is at the heart of why Nazi Germany develops uh, a characteristic means of fighting. It will ultimately be referred to as Blitzkrieg lightning warfare, the close coordination between air and ground elements, moving rapidly toward strategically important locations on the battlefield for the purposes of outmaneuvering your enemy. And what Blitzkrieg requires is not just speed and dynamism, it requires a hell of a lot of machinery. You need planes, you need tanks, you need armoured personnel carriers, you need cars. The whole military strategy of the Germans, uh, Blitzkrieg, was based upon mechanised manoeuvre warfare, and that doesn't work, obviously, without oil. The only problem was, Germany didn't have any oil fields. Hitler's stuck in this catch-22. This is a man who overtly wants to conquer the world, and yet he's only got, and along with Japan, about 3% of the world's oil, while the Allies have 90% of the world's oil. Now, if you want to conquer the planet, you've got to invade the countries which have the oil, and you can't just invade them with horses. So you know, you're stuck in this absolute catch-22 problem in which he has no oil in order to conquer the world to get the oil. Ultimately, 
Hitler gets all the oil he needs to start his war from a most unlikely source. Joseph Stalin. And he does this through the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact of August 23rd, 1939. It establishes, first of all, a non-aggression treaty between the Soviet Union and National Socialist Germany. Uh, but then, just a few months thereafter, a commercial uh, agreement is established between the two nations. And this commercial agreement will see the exchange of vast amounts of food, and then, more importantly, oil. When you think of the invasion of the Low Countries, like Belgium and Holland, that is all running on communist-supplied oil. And then you think of all those planes, those fighter aircraft and bombers in the Blitz and the Battle of Britain. Where does that oil come from? Stalin. This is Russian oil. In exchange for German money and equipment, Stalin gives Hitler all the oil he needs to fight his war. This is, seems to be a deal that has worked out really well, both politically and economically, for both the powers. So from the point of view of Stalin, why on earth would the Germans be mad enough to break this deal when it's working out so well for both of them? Stalin gets a rude awakening on the 22nd of June, 1941. When the blow came, it was from five different directions. And from the north, one extra, just for luck. Operation Barbarossa is one of the greatest invasions ever mounted in human history. You've got three and a half million Germans and their Axis allies pouring across the border into the Soviet Union on the 22nd of June, 1941. Stalin never thinks that this invasion is going to happen. He ignores the warnings he's received from his whole network of spies that the Germans were in fact preparing to attack him. Why would Hitler renege on a deal that was sweet for both of them? Clearly, this was, this was nuts. He's astounded when the Germans attack. And most ironically of all, so much of that invasion force, so many of those tanks and planes and other weapons that are pouring into Soviet Union are being run on oil that's come from the Soviet Union. The Soviet Transcaucasian Republics are an oil field just in and of themselves. The area between the Kuban and the Caspian Sea provides some of the richest oil wealth on planet Earth. And it is because of that that the Soviets sought to protect that very critical area and the Germans sought to capture it. So the oil production processes around Baku and the Northern Caucasus were the prize. It is for this reason that in spring 1942, Hitler launches a massive push south to secure the Transcaucasian oil fields. So the story goes, the Nazis were so confident they were going to get their hands on Baku that the generals even ordered a cake to be baked with the icing showing the Caspian Sea and with Baku right at the centre. So it turns out that this film was probably a fake put out by a Soviet propaganda unit in order to discredit the Nazis. But you know what? The Nazis were so arrogant that, frankly, everyone believed it anyway. But the oil factories of Baku are not the only target of the campaign. The oil wealth of the region is centered around a series of cities that include Baku, Grozny and Chechnya, and then the city of Maikop. Now, Baku is by far the largest of all those, but Maikop is vital. And Hitler knows that Maikop is vital. And he says, if I cannot get the oil fields of Maikop and Grozny, then I'm going to have to end this war. The Germans will ultimately capture Maikop. The only thing is, is that when they get there, they find that Soviet scorched earth policies were such that the enemy had burned all of the drilling facilities and left wreckage instead of a fully functioning oil field. You've got this very hubristic, arrogant idea perpetuated amongst the Nazis that the Soviets, the Russians, are just stupid. They are untermenschen, and uh, when we take over their country, 
everything's gonna go well. Well, of course, the Russians aren't stupid because as soon as they know that my cop's gonna be taken, the first thing that they do is, is pour concrete into the wells and, and, and they smash up all the drill bits and take them away with them. There's just so many yes monkeys in the Nazi hierarchy that nobody sort of sits down and points out the obvious, which is that if Russia can't take their drills with them, then they're gonna just make damn sure you can't use them either. You've got an oil field, yeah, but you, you've got nothing to tap it with. So you've got this situation now in which the people who are stupid and left scratching their heads ain't the Soviets, but it's the Nazis. The most the Nazis ever got out of Mykop was 70 barrels of oil a day. By comparison, in the first year of the German invasion alone, Baku produced an astonishing 342,000 barrels of oil every single day, more than 15 times the total Germany could produce in a year. This would prove absolutely crucial in fueling the Soviet fight back. Deprived of the oil they needed, Hitler's panzers ground to a halt only halfway to Baku. But worse was to come. The key to controlling the area was the giant river Volga, which runs into the Caspian Sea. In order to control the Volga River, in order to control the oil that's coming from Azerbaijan, it will be necessary to seize and control the city of Stalingrad. Stalingrad's essential, it's strategically vital. Why? Because it sits on the Volga. That city anchors the left flank of Army Group South, the German force that will pivot and move down toward the Caucasus Mountains. And because it controls access to the Caspian Sea by way of the Volga River, it will be necessary to capture the city itself. And this is what will lead to the greatest clash of arms in military history. Stalingrad is absolutely legendary. It's huge, it's epic. It's kind of everything that you might grimly want a battle to be. You've got a, a Soviet force of 187,000 men holding out against an army of more than a million. That's an over five to one ratio. It is the most bitter, brutal fighting. It's savage, it's dirty, and the Germans are going to lose. Stalingrad marked the beginning of the end for the Nazis in World War II. Now the Soviet fight back ramped up. Spearheaded by T-34 tanks and Sturmovik tankbuster aircraft, driven on the fuel the Nazis had failed to wrest from the Russians. But as Stalin raced to beat the Allies to Berlin, it began to dawn on the Western powers that his tanks might not stop there. The post-war conference that immediately follows VE Day at Potsdam near Berlin is one in which the post-war world is being finalized. There's immense nervousness at Potsdam for good reason, because what the Allies in the West fear is that Stalin may not want to stop at Berlin. Stalin even jokingly says that Tsar Alexander went all the way to Paris. Now, sometimes, you know, you make a joke and, and actually you secretly mean it because Stalin had also drawn up a plan with his high command to work out how they could invade Western Europe. Part of the post-war plan for the Soviet Union is that they will have a sphere of influence that could extend all the way to Paris. And in fact, Stalin is only really deterred by the use of the atomic bomb because he realizes that if he really does try to punch his way through to Paris, just as Hitler had done, he's gonna face a weapon more mighty than he could possibly imagine. Instead, Stalin and the Soviets used oil from the factories of Baku and the Volga to drive their tanks into Eastern Europe. In the peace that followed, they would use it to freeze those states behind the Iron Curtain and fight a very different kind of war. As the Nazis retreated at the end of World War II, Soviet tanks helped install Stalinist regimes into Romania, Hungary, Poland, Czechoslovakia, 
and Bulgaria. When the Hungarian people protested in 1956, Soviet tanks quashed the rebellion. They helped wall off East Germany from the West in 1961 and ground the tentative shoots of the Prague Spring under their tracks in 1968. There are some really dark days in the Cold War, and actually you have this phrase, tanks on the streets, becoming the kind of byword for Soviet repression. We see it in the 50s, we see it in the 60s. Every time there's a problem in a satellite state, the Soviet Union puts tanks on the streets. And those tanks on the street, they don't just run on air, they run on oil. But behind the scenes, the successors to Joseph Stalin found a far more subtle and insidious way of keeping their vassal states in line. One of the ways in which the Soviet Union controlled satellite states, uh, both within Europe and elsewhere, is through supplying them with oil. What this means is that the satellite states are tied into long-term trading arrangements with the Soviet Union, whereby they get oil from the Soviet Union at below world market rates. The supply of oil it has very strong parallels to the supply of, of narcotics. You create dependency and you create demand. And so you've got these states that are kind of almost as dependent as a kind of drug addict on this supply of oil. On the upside, they get oil for cheap. The downside is that therefore they become totally dependent upon Soviet oil supplies, which can be cut off at a moment's notice. And that means that if it is cut off, that their economy will simply collapse. So you've got a kind of vassal state relationship, and it's entirely dependent on oil. That link was tightened during the 1960s by laying supply pipelines to each of the Soviet states. Imagine this is the friendship pipeline that runs from Russia through Ukraine. As long as people are doing exactly as Russia wants, the oil keeps flowing. But if they get ticked off, the oil goes off. That means that Russia has got a source of hard currency, but also the ability, as long as a price is high, to exert political pressure on people desperate for this commodity. By the end of the 1980s, Soviet oil and gas exports had almost tripled and accounted for more than 80% of Russia's hard currency. Then, the bottom fell out of the energy market. The price of oil throughout the world begins to decline quite steadily from the peak that it had reached in the early 1980s. Suddenly, the Soviet Union is in a desperate situation. She desperately still wants to try and sell her oil as, as cheaply as she can just to get some really, really much needed foreign currency. And here is where the Soviets' insistence on pipelines suddenly comes back to bite them. The problem with a pipeline running from Russia to the West is that it runs through someone else's territory. And if they choose, they can simply uh, turn it off the oil stops flowing. Now, you won't do that when the oil price is high, but when it's low, you can exert pressure on Russia simply by saying, we don't want your oil. As the fall of the Berlin Wall ushered in a new era of unfettered free enterprise under the stewardship of Boris Yeltsin, the Yeltsin regime found itself so desperate for cash that it sold off most of its oil franchises at rock-bottom prices just to pay the bills. What happens in the aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet Union when Yeltsin is in power is that the Russian oil industry, like most other major industries, is privatized, basically. The industry comes to be captured by a relatively small number of people. This provokes extreme backlash and hostility from the Russian population because they're experiencing effectively an economic collapse which they blame upon the oligarchs, as they're called, who have benefited from this process. That backlash gives rise to a politician cast in a familiar Soviet-style mould. 
if you're constantly being trampled on by the oligarchs and you feel that they are basically abusing the system, they are appropriating your wealth effectively, then you're going to vote for a strong man. You're going to vote for a man to try and whip these oligarchs into line, to try and get them to give up some of their wealth, to try and get them to redistribute some of it. You need a hard man. And that's when they look at Putin and they go, OK, yeah, you may, you may be a son of a bitch, but you're our son of a bitch. So let's vote for you and, and you get it sorted. And in a way, you are sort of mandating a dictatorship for your own benefit, you hope. Putin comes to power partly by making a deal with these oligarchs, but also by essentially promising to act as the agent of the Russian population at large against the oligarchic class. Putin now controls the key factories that run the kingdom, just as there is a rise in the international price of oil. In a way, Putin's lucky because the price of oil skyrockets. When Yeltsin was around, you're looking at oil going for $20 a barrel. With Putin, it's $150 a barrel. That gives him an enormous amount of economic power. The post-Soviet satellite states of Eastern Europe find he has them literally over a barrel. If they don't bow down to Putin, they've only got to look at the examples of Belarus and Ukraine to see what happens. Belarus toes Putin's line and pays five times less for its fuel than the newly independent regime in the Ukraine, which works out as a hell of a lot of money. And when you've got Putin getting really annoyed with you, like he does with the Ukraine in 2009, what does he do? He simply pulls out the plug and he leaves you running dry. But the Cold War of the Caspian's oil factories is no longer going all Putin's way. Two things have happened in terms of oil in Azerbaijan and the Caspian Basin generally. One of them is that large fields have been discovered both offshore and in Kazakhstan which were not developed during the Soviet period. So there's a major new source of oil there. You've got American oil giants like Chevron and Moco. They're investing billions in helping the governments of Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan to tap into these vast wells. There's some serious money involved. You have a significant pipeline, which is the one major pipeline that is not controlled by the Russian state pipeline monopoly. And that piece of kit is a thousand miles long, pumps a million barrels of oil a day, and it's shifting the crude from offshore and into the world market. And this means that there's oil flowing out of the fields in uh, the Caspian Basin, which are not under the control of the Russian state and Putin. That pipeline, and you can see it drawn on a map, it's like a thread to pull those countries away from Russia. Whether it's Baku's oil is going to help them maintain that independence remains to be seen, but it just shows what a powerful political tool oil remains. Oil has undeniably shaped Baku's past. The question is, can it help shape the future?